Parsha's Naso is the longest parsha in the Torah, 176 verses. Unlike last week where we had no mitzvos, there's 18 mitzvos in this week's parsha. And it begins right where it left off last week. Last week, we counted the Levites. In fact, we counted the Levites twice. We counted initially the Levites from the age of one month and older. And then we counted the Levites between the age of 30 and 50, which is the working age when they actually are tasked with the maintenance and the transportation of the items of the tabernacle. Last week, we counted the family of Pihas, and the Parsha begins with the counting of the working age men of the other two Levite families and delineating their responsibilities. So it begins, Hashem spoke to Moses saying, take the census of the sons of Gershon as well, according to the father's household, according to their families from the age of 30 to the age of 50. And this is the work that they need to do. They have to carry the curtains of the tabernacle and of the tent of meeting, the cover. It lists all the responsibilities of what they need to carry when the Mishkan, when the tabernacle is disassembled and it's moved to a new location, this family is in charge of moving this specific list of items. And then it concludes, this is the work of the sons of the Gershonites in the tent of meeting, and their charge shall be under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron, the Kohen. The family of Kehas, they were overseen by Aaron's eldest surviving son, Elazar. We read about that last week. And now Ithamar, the youngest surviving son of Aaron, he's the supervisor of the families of Gershon and Merari. So of the three Levite families, two of them are overseen by the younger son, Ithamar, and the oldest son, Elazar. He's in charge of overseeing the work and the transportation and the responsibilities of the family of Kahas from last week. And it continues, like it did with Gershon, the family of Merari, what their particular responsibilities are. And then it concludes, you shall appoint them by name to the utensils that they are to carry on their watch. This is the work of the families of the sons of Merari, according to all the work in the tent of meeting, under the authority of Ithamar, the son of Aaron the Kohen. So it specifically points out that the Torah tells us that we have to appoint them by name to the utensils that they are to carry. In the Rabban, he explains that these tasks were assigned on an individual level. Each person was was responsible. Okay, this is your plank, or this is your bar, or these are the pillars that you are responsible to carry and you can't just, it wasn't just done, oh, you're, this family's in charge of these planes. It was done on an individual per capita basis. Now, why is it only mentioned now? Why only by the third family, the family of Marari, are we told this important insight that the responsibilities have to be dispensed on a per capita basis? Each individual, which particular planes and which particular pieces of wood and which particular items they have to carry. So the Rabban explains that the family of Merari, the weight of the items that they had to carry was substantial. And therefore, you may think that, hey, if I have these planes, maybe I can have someone else, my friend, he can help me schlep them. Therefore, specifically, we're told that every individual is assigned by name. What precisely must you take? And you can't shirk your responsibilities and you cannot give it to someone else. And I think there's a valuable lesson here that the Levites, the leaders of the Jewish people, they were assigned what their particular responsibilities were. They didn't choose it. The positions of leadership, the responsibilities were given to them, were assigned to them. And like we saw last week, some of the Levites in the temple itself and in the tabernacle, they were ushers, they were doormen. Some of them were singers. And in fact, the halacha is very strict about saying that it's forbidden for someone to do the job that they weren't assigned someone else's job. And I think there's a valuable lesson for us over here. We maybe erroneously assume that what happens to us in our lives and the various circumstances in which we find ourselves, that's happenstance, that's chance. And of course, we believe that it's the Almighty who's manipulating what happens and what you encounter and what role you end up playing in society and the community is actually assigned to you by the Almighty. And You cannot avoid it. You can't say, oh, I want to have a different responsibility. You have to embrace that. But also you have to believe that you have the strength to bear that load, to fulfill that responsibility. 
Maybe if you were from the family of Marari and they said, okay, these two enormous planks from the western side of the tabernacle, that's your job. And you look at it and it's big, it's heavy, and you look at yourself, you look kind of frail. How can I do it? The answer is if the Almighty gave you that task, then indeed he will also give you the strength to be able to fulfill it. There is an amazing story that I like to share about this. My grandfather, of blessed memory, he spent many years as the head of the yeshiva in the town of Be'er Yaakov. The yeshiva is called the yeshiva of Be'er Yaakov. And one of his roles, one of his responsibilities in the yeshiva was that every week he would give a lesson, a musr lesson, a musr lecture to the entire student body. And in fact, we have today, as the heirs of my grandfather's legacy, we have thousands of handwritten notes and essays that he wrote based upon his weekly lectures in the yeshiva. He wouldn't just recycle material. Every week he would come up with something new, something amazing. And there was one week where something very unusual happened. He was slated to give his weekly lecture to the entire student body and he came up with nothing. And the more he tried to study and the more he tried to immerse himself in some idea to see if something develops, if he could develop it into into a lecture, he found that he had no success. And the time for his discourse is swiftly approaching and he doesn't really have anything to say. And what's he going to do? Everyone's going to be waiting, sitting down, waiting for him to give a speech and he's not going to have anything to say. And he decides to just walk to the yeshiva grounds and find out what – he's in the hands of the Almighty. He has no solution about what to do and the time is near and it's time to go. So he gets dressed and puts on his his frock coat, his rabbinic frock coat and his hat and he heads to the yeshiva facilities. And when he gets there, something that never happened before and never happened since happened. His partner in the yeshiva, the Rosh Yeshiva, the head of the yeshiva, he came to him and said to him, I have a very unusual request. My father-in-law is in town and he wanted to know if it would be possible for you to relinquish your weekly spot and allow him to speak. He wants to speak to the yeshiva boys. And then my grandfather said that it, it hit him. Maybe previously he thought that, you know, he was able to study and he was able to immerse himself in Torah and come up with a brilliant lecture, a brilliant discourse every week. And now he realized that, no, this was the role that the Almighty assigned to him. And therefore, the Almighty said, I'm going to give you the ability to fulfill the mission that I entrusted you with. But when you don't need to give it, well, then you're on your own. And of course, what can we accomplish when we're on our own? We can't accomplish anything. And that kind of put it into perspective, this idea that we see over here, that each one of the Levites on an individual level is assigned with a certain responsibility and that is given to them by God, assigned to them by name. That's what the Almighty apportioned for them. It's their responsibility. They cannot give it to others, but they also should be comforted by the fact that they know that they'll have the ability to fulfill it. Chapter 4 concludes with the final tallies of each one of these three families and the totals, the amount of working age Levites from all three families. It was 8,580. He counted them at the word of Hashem through Moses, every one over his work and over his burden, and his count was as Hashem had commanded Moses. Chapter 5 begins with an interesting law, and that is the purification of the camp. After the tabernacle is erected, it's time to make sure that the people who are not allowed to be on the tabernacle grounds are not there. So we read, command the children of Israel that they shall expel from the camp everyone who has tsaras. Tsaras, of course, is the skin ailment that really is a spiritual malady manifested by skin disease. Anyone has a zava mission and anyone contaminated by a human corpse. And Rashi tells us, that this instruction was recited to Moses on the day that the tabernacle was erected, the first day of Nisan, two weeks shy of the anniversary of the Exodus. 
The Rashi tells us that the camp of the Jewish people was divided up into three different camps. You had, of course, in the tabernacle, it's called the, the camp of God, the camp of the Shekhinah, the divine presence. Surrounding that, you had the camp of the Levites. They were right in the middle, in the epicenter, surrounding the tabernacle. And in all four directions, you have the encampments of the various tribes, like we spoke about last week. Each three tribes were given one direction, and they had their flags, etc. And these three people, the people who have tsaras, people who have zav emissions, and the people who have, who have become contaminated by a human corpse, they have diff- they, they all have to be expelled from the camp, but the rules are different. Someone who has tsaras, they get sent out of all three camps. They have to go outside of the entire encampment of the Jewish people. The Zav is allowed to live, allowed to inhabit in the camp of Israel, but not in the camp of the Levites, nor the camp of God. And someone who has become contaminated to a dead body, that person is only not allowed, is only expelled from the camp of God, but can even reside, can even dwell in the camp of the Levites. And then we read an, another interesting law that doesn't seem to be relevant at all, and that is what happens when someone steals from a convert. And uh, the connection, the Ramban tells us, what's the relevance? We're just talking about you know the counting of the Jewish people and the count of the Levites, and now the setting up of the tabernacle. How does this relate to someone stealing from a convert? So the Ramban explains that we just counted the biological Jews, the Jews that fit into the 12 tribes of Israel. We did not count the mixed multitude, namely all the converts, the Egyptians that joined the Jewish people in the Exodus. And you may think that, well, they weren't counted and therefore they're fair game. We could do with them whatever we want. And therefore the Torah reinforces that, no, they're Jews, they're your Jewish brethren. And it tells us the law, the specific law that relates to what happens when someone steals from a convert. So when someone steals from anyone, we read the following law, a man or woman who commits any of a man's sins, which specifically we find out in the commentaries means stealing, and they confess, then when they have to pay, they pay the principal, what they actually stole, and they have to add a penalty of a fifth. What if the person that they stole from has no heirs and they died? Well, then the debt is returned to the Kohen, and in addition, the person has to bring an atonement sacrifice. And Rashi explains that this is a very unique case. How is it possible for someone who is Jewish? After all, we're all relatives. We're all descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So maybe we're not first cousins, but we're second cousins or third cousins or four cousins. Eventually, we're all related. How is it possible for someone to not have any kinsmen, not not to have any relatives? Rashi tells us that what this means is this is a unique case where there is a Jew who has no halachic relatives, and that is by a convert. If someone converts from a halachic standpoint, they're like a baby that was born, and we don't view them as related to their biological family from a halachic perspective. And therefore, in this case, if a man has no kinsman, it goes to the Kohen. So if someone steals from a convert and swears falsely and subsequently the convert dies and the convert has no heirs, i.e. he didn't get married and have children after he converted, then the money has to go to the Kohen. As a side note, the Talmud proves from this verse that a child cannot bear children. Why? What does it say? If the man has no kinsman, meaning if it's a man who converted – and then they have no kinsmen, then the money goes to the Kohen, but is, but is implied from this that only a man must you go seek out to see if they have any kinsmen, but if it's a child, a child who converted, a child convert, in that case, you don't need to inspect to find out if they have any children, because we know from a biological perspective, you have to hit adolescence before you can be fertile. And then we read two more laws in verse 9 and verse 10. And every portion from any of the holies that the children of Israel bring to the Kohen shall be his. There's a dispute here. Rashi understands this to refer to the Bikurim, the Rabban. He understands that it's a different kind of gift that's offered to the Kohen. It's the Truma gift. And it belongs to the to the Kohen. A man's holies shall be his. And what a man shall give to the Kohen shall be his. 
So there's two explanations here in Rashi. What is this verse 10? What, what's it telling us? That a man's holies, meaning the money that they give to the Kohen, is his. So Rashi explains in the first explanation that the owner gets the goodwill of deciding to which of the Kohanim and Levites he gives the tithes. So when someone has a field and they have a crop and a yield, they have to give 10% to the Levite and they have to give around 2% to the Kohen. The 10% is called the tithing and the truma is the 2% that goes to the Kohen. Now, which Levite merits the 10% of the tithing and which Kohen gets the 2% of the truma? That goodwill, meaning the decision to be able to decide to which Kohen and which Levite the tithes go to, that goodwill belongs to the Israelite who is the landowner. That's the first understanding. That the holies, meaning the donations that he has to give, he chooses to whom he wants to give it. And then Rashi says there's something very interesting in the second explanation, and that is if someone decides that they don't want to tithe, they don't want to be generous. They want to be more miserly. 10%, I'm going to give to the Levite. I don't want to do that. Well, someone who does that decision, someone who makes that decision, someone who makes that calculation, he should know that the tithes will indeed be yours. You think you're going to save money by not giving the 10%. You'll end up with that 10%, but you'll lose the 90%. This is a promise from God, so to speak. If someone withholds from tithing, eventually they will get those tithes, but they'll lose everything else. And... Then the Torah tells us an entire section here, really it's a whole book of Talmud to understand all the details of it, and that is the laws of a sota, a suspected adulteress. God spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, any man whose wife shall go astray and commit treachery against him, and a man could have lain with her carnally, it was hidden from the eyes of the husband, she becomes secluded, they, they could have been defiled, there's no witness, then the laws of the sota, of the suspected adulteress, chicken, meaning a man is not sure if his wife is behaving faithfully. He warns her, don't seclude with this man. The woman secludes with the man anyhow, and there's witnesses that they secluded. We don't know what happened behind closed doors, but we could maybe suspect that maybe she committed adultery. In that case, the laws of the sota kick in. So there's a few interesting Rashi's here at the beginning of this section in verse 12. First of all, Rashi asks the question, there's a very unusual juxtaposition. It begins talking about in verse 10, what happens if someone doesn't want to give the tithing to the Kohen. And immediately afterwards, it talks about what happens when someone's wife, God forbid, is suspected of committing adultery. What's the possible connection? So Rashi tells us something very interesting and maybe um, a little bit not so easily understandable. The connection is... If you don't want to give the Kohen his rightfully deserved tithing, you'll eventually go to the Kohen, but not for tithing, for something much worse, because maybe your wife, she'll be a suspected adulteress and you'll have to go to the Kohen. What's a little bit unusual about this is that there doesn't seem to be really a connection between the husband's sin of not tithing and the wife's sin or suspected sin of adultery. I think there's room to speculate as to what exactly is the connection. Why would the husband's sin of not tithing, why would that contribute towards the wife's sin of adultery? And there's another interesting Rashi here in verse 12. It says, a man and a man, which is the literal reading, if a man, any man's wife commits treachery against him, this tells us that when a woman commits adultery, she is rebelling not only against her husband, but she's also rebelling against God. We look at a union of a husband and wife to have really an invisible third partner. The Talmud tells us that every child has really three parents, father, Mother, those are the biological parents, and of course, God, who endows him with his spiritual components. And therefore, a husband and wife unit, that unit, really, if they're meritorious, there's a third party, and that is God. And therefore, when the woman, or of course, the man, when they are disloyal to the union, when they're unfaithful, when they don't have fidelity, it's not only their spouse to whom they've committed a grievous sin, but it's also a sin and a rebellion against God. A third interesting idea we see in Rashi in verse 12 
is that Rashi, again, this is, he understands the Hebrew word of going astray to have overlap with the word that means insanity. And the way Rashi explains, quoting from the Talmud, that a man and a woman only sin, only commit adultery if a spirit of temporary insanity enters them. A sin is not an act that makes sense. A sane person won't do it. Why? Because a sin is when someone prioritizes this life, their life as it's currently oriented, body that's housing a soul. They embrace that, they prioritize that, and they reject their soul. They reject the eternal part of themselves and their eternal life. And for someone to do that, it's totally logical because they are favoring the temporary, the ephemeral, in exchange for forfeiting the permanent. And that is why sin is, in effect, according to Rashi, and according to the Talmud, it has within it an aspect of insanity. So what happens? The man's now jealous of his wife. He warned her. She secluded herself. The man shall bring his wife to the Kohen, and he shall bring her offering for her. A tenth ephah of barley flour. Don't pour oil over it. Don't put frankincense upon it. It's a meal offering of jealousies, a meal offering of remembrance, a reminder of iniquity. So she has to go to the temple with her with her husband, and she brings this very specific offering uh, made out of barley flowers. So Rashi tells us that there's all kinds of symbolism in this offering. First of all, it's barley flour, not wheat flour. And the Talmud, and in fact, many places in Jewish literature, tells us that barley is food for animals, it's animal fodder. Whereas wheat, that's food for humans. And what it tells us is that if someone commits adultery, they're acting somewhat like an animal. They're favoring the animalistic side and they're eschewing their spiritual side. And therefore, that's the kind of offering that she brings. Uh, There's no oil on it. And oil makes it really beautiful. This is something that's not so beautiful. Uh, There's no frankincense upon it. Rashi tells us the frankincense that refers to the matriarchs, the mothers of the Jewish people, this woman, or at least she's suspected of departing from the ways of the matriarchs. And there's a very interesting idea here that my grandfather used to always say, that this offering, this sacrifice, this meal offering that the suspected adulteress brings, the verse tells us it is a remembrance of sin, it's a monument of sin. And my grandfather explained that because this offering is there to invoke the sin, we want to make it as forgettable as possible. And therefore, it's not made out of wheat, there's no oil, there's no frankincense. It's it's really downplayed in order that should be forgotten. My grandfather quoted an unnamed book that says that how does someone know when they sinned? How do they know that they've been atoned for, they've been expiated. How do they know that, indeed, the sin has been forgiven by God? When do you know it's forgiven? When you, indeed, forget it. And that's why we have to strive to forget our sins, to not dwell upon them, because the more we dwell upon them, the more we think about them, the more we're still connected to it, and the sin is not being ignored. It's not being removed from within ourselves. And therefore, over here, When the Sota, the suspected adulteress, is bringing an offering, which is a testament, which is a memorial, which is a remembrance of sin, it should be as forgettable as possible. Now, once she brings the offering, there's a major effort to try to get her to confess. We don't know what happened behind closed doors. Did she commit adultery? Did she not commit adultery? Only God knows and only the people involved know. However, we're going to do a process that will verify whether indeed she sinned. And if she did sin, she and the perpetrator, the the adulterer, will both die in a miraculous fashion. However, the Kohen is encouraged to try to do whatever he can to get her to confess. If he could elicit a confession, if she could say, I sinned, I committed adultery, then she doesn't go through this process and they could amicably divorce and she could be an adulteress, a confirmed adulteress, and 
we don't have to verify via the SOTA process. And therefore, the Kohen does whatever he can, makes your move, does things that will hopefully drive her a little crazy, maybe even embarrass her in order to evoke, in order to elicit a confession. So he tells her that if no man was with you, you've not strayed or defiled with someone other than your husband, then these waters, the waters that he prepared, are going to prove you're innocent. But if you have strayed with someone other than your husband, not only in this instance where there's a suspected case of adulterous, of adultery based upon seclusion, but any time, if you've been, if you've had any infidelity towards your husband, then you will die by drinking this bitter waters, the waters in which the name of God was erased, it's going to enter your innards, it's going to cause your stomach to distend and your thighs to collapse. And the woman accepts upon it and he writes upon a scroll the entire section of the, of the sota, the Torah section over here. He erases it in the bitter waters, puts some dust in the water as well. She drinks it. And if she committed the sin, if she did adultery, she would die right then and there. And if not, the Torah tells us that she would be given a great blessing. She would have tremendous fertility. If she, if she was infertile, she'll become fertile. If she was fertile, but she only had a baby every two years, she will have a baby every year. If she had lots of babies, but they were short, they'll be tall. They'll be more beautiful. They will be more male. They'll be more handsome. Whatever it is, she will be blessed. So that's the basic story of the Sota. The Ramban here has a very interesting essay about the nature of this miracle and the purpose of this miracle. And he points out that there is no other law in the Torah that is entirely miraculous as this one. This wondrous, permanent miracle that happened to the Jewish people. Namely, that these waters, these bitter waters that the Kohen would, would prepare would be able to verify whether or not the woman committed adultery or not. And this only happened when the Jewish people, or at least the majority of them, were doing the will of God. And the purpose for it, says the Ramban, is in order to ensure that people don't behave in adulterous, in promiscuous ways, and to cleanse Israel from bastardom, that people shouldn't be sleeping around in a way that defiles the Jewish nation in order that the presence of God should be amongst us. And therefore, the Ramban quotes the Talmud that when adultery became rampant, the waters of the Sota stopped working. Not to say that if someone quits adultery, they're off the hook, but because this miracle was done for the glory of the Jewish people, that we could in fact be the holy nation— if we don't value it, if we don't desire it, if we don't sincerely want to make sure that our families, that our generation, that our communities are holy, then the Almighty says, okay, I'm not going to make this miracle for you. There's another interesting idea here, and that is that in the event that the woman indeed did not commit the adultery, then she's given a tremendous blessing. And the question is, that why does she really deserve the blessing? You know, she was innocent. Yes, she didn't commit the adultery. But what did she do? She aroused her husband's jealousy to make him warn her to not go into seclusion with this man. She did it anyhow. And the witnesses saw that. Yes, she didn't do the actual sin. But should she indeed be rewarded for that? Didn't she bring herself close to the precipice? And the answer perhaps is that when someone displays true strength to not capitulate, even in the depths of lust, that is something that really is admirable. They are like a lion who is overcoming their nature, their desires to do the will of God. And indeed, that is someone that is worthy of a tremendous blessing. Chapter 6 tells the law of a Nazir. Now, it's interesting. Rashi tells us, the Talmud tells us several places that the story of the Sota 
is next to the story of the Nazir, which is an individual that accepts upon him or herself a vow to refrain from consuming wine or any other grape derivatives, to not come into contact with dead people, and to not get any haircuts for a given period of time, typically for 30 days. What is the connection between the Sota and the Nazir? Why are they juxtaposed here in the Torah? Not only that, in the books of Talmud, the book of Sota and the book of Nazir, which go into these laws in great detail, obviously, they're also next to each other in the order and the listing of, of the Talmud. The answer is, says the Talmud, because when someone sees a Sota, when someone sees a woman that may have descended to a very low spiritual place, they should make themselves into a Nazir. They should distance themselves from wine because wine leads to levity. Wine could potentially lead to infidelity. And therefore, someone who sees this should make themselves into a Nazir to make sure that doesn't happen to them. And the Muslim masters would always talk about this idea that when you see someone else sinning, your initial instinct is to say, wow, what a terrible sinner. What a depraved individual. You look negatively down at them. Whereas over here, the Torah tells us that when you see someone sinning, you have to realize that it could happen to you. And therefore, you have to point it inwardly. You have to say, what can I do to ensure that I don't make the same blunder, I don't make the same mistake, I don't fall into the same trap as they did? And I think this is a very deep point. You know, if you see the Sota, she's being brought to Jerusalem, being brought to the temple, to the tabernacle, and she's being degraded, she's being ashamed, she's being ostracized for her behavior, won't that distance you from behaving the same way? Won't that make you less likely for committing that kind of sin? And I think that the idea is that even after someone sees the terrible consequences of sin, that still kind of removes a level between those two people. Even if you see how bad it is, even if you see how much damage it could create, how much pain it could engender, once you see it, once you visualize it, that creates a certain connection that you have with it, and there is now a definite possibility that you could fall into the same trap and therefore you make yourself into a Nazir and you do whatever you can to make sure that you avoid that same fate. Now, we read about the Nazir and it starts off, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, a man or a woman who shall disassociate himself by taking a Nazareth vow of abstinence for the sake of Hashem. So the commentaries point out that a man who makes himself into an azir, in Hebrew, the word is yifla, which literally means does something wondrous. And the Ibn Ezra says that when someone does something like this, someone takes concrete steps to dissociate themselves from the mundane, to make themselves like an ascetic, to distance themselves from the ways of the masses, the masses who follow the, their lusts, that something is indeed a wonder to behold. So what are the laws? They have taken a vow of abstinence for the sake of God. They shouldn't eat new wine or old wine. Don't drink vinegar, anything that's grape derivatives, not even dry grapes. All the days of his abstinence, anything made from wine, grapes, even the pips or stins, he shall not eat. That's the first law. All the days of his Nazarite vow, a razor shall not pass over his head until the completion of the days when he completes his Nazarite period. And then the third law, verse 6, all the days of his abstinence for the sake of Hashem, he shall not come near a dead person. So there's a very fascinating teaching here in the Baal HaTurim. Why should he not come into contact with dead people? Because when someone becomes a Nazir, when someone accepts upon himself this vow to dissociate him or herself from this world and its pleasures and dedicate themselves to God, it's quite likely that they're going to become a prophet as a result. And if they're in contact with dead people, people may say the reason why they achieve prophecy is via talking to dead people. And therefore, it's critical that they don't come into contact with dead people so that no one makes the mistake that the spiritual pinnacle that they reach was a result of anything 
from the dead, rather a result from them personally overcoming their innate animalistic character and designating themselves for God. There's a very powerful idea here in the Sephorno. He explains that the, the concept of the Nazir is for someone to become like the Kohen Gadol, like the high priest. Just like the high priest is someone who is above the rest of the people. They're designated for holiness. They're for God. They're not for the rest of the people. They kind of have uplifted themselves. Their, their stature is above the rest of the populace. And even when their close relative dies, they don't defile themselves. They don't lower them their, their status. So too, a Nazir becomes like a Kohen for a limited amount of time. You could become a Kohen, like a high priest, for a limited amount of time and to upgrade yourself to live in a higher plane. And the hope is that even after you complete your term, you retain those accomplishments and that stature. Now, what if this person becomes contaminated unintentionally? If a person should die near him with quick suddenness, meaning that the, the Nazir is trying to mind his own business, and the guy next to him just drops dead, and now he became contaminated. So he has to go through a purification process and start the Naz- Nazir period again. He has to shave his head and spend seven plus one, eight days in purification, bring various sacrifices, shave his head, and then rededicate himself to God And the initial days that he started, those days should fall aside. They don't count. You start from square one. So a few interesting points here. Rashi tells us that when someone becomes a Nazir and then unintentionally is disqualified because he comes in contact with a dead person, they have to bring various sacrifices, including an atonement sacrifice. And the question that Rashi asks is, why does the Nazir, who unintentionally became impure, why does he need to bring a sin offering? And he explains, one opinion, is that, well, you should have been more careful. You're a Nazir, you cannot come into contact with dead people, and even though it wasn't your fault, but you should have been even more careful. And therefore, it's it's as if you committed a sin. Then he quotes the Talmud. The Talmud, a second opinion is that the reason why the Nazir has to bring an atonement sacrifice is because you pained yourself via abstinence from wine. Judaism is about gratification and reward. And yes, it's not about indulgence. But when God says something's okay and you say, no, I'm going to make it prohibited, you're causing yourself pain. And when you cause yourself pain, that's a sin that you have to atone for. We may think that Judaism, maybe even religion more broadly, is about suffering. I'll suffer here, but in the afterlife, in Olam Abba, I'll have it good. And here we find out the answer is no. If you pain yourself here needlessly, you're a sinner, and you have to bring a, an atonement offering as a sinner. We t- look at Torah as God's gift to us. It's the tools to have the most pleasure that we could have, not only in Olam Abba, not only in the spiritual realm, but also over here. And when this person restricts himself needlessly, that constitutes a sin. So what happens? He became impure and he has to go back to square one, back to the very beginning. And I think this is something very challenging when it happens. You know, when someone invests so much effort, they work so hard, they nearly complete this monumental task, and now they're going back to the beginning. You can imagine someone accepts upon himself this vow of 30 days to be a Nazir, and on day 29, the guy next to him on the subway happens to drop dead, and now he's back to square one, back to day zero, and you may think that they want to give up. And here we see the what's required of, of, of such a person is a certain degree of tenacity. We have to be relentless. We have to be tenacious. We have to be indefatigable. We have to get up, you fall down, you get back up. And of course, this is an idea that's not only applied to the Nazir, but it's a general principle that we have to do throughout our lives. We're going to face disappointments, and it's important for us to not get too down, to wallow too much in our suffering, but to forge ahead and to pick up where we left off and to restart with vigor. 
when the Nazir indeed does complete his term and it was done entirely perfectly, this should be the law of the Nazir. On the day his abstinence is completed, he shall bring himself to the entrance of the tent of meeting. My grandfather pointed out he should bring himself. The verse says he should bring himself. At many junctures of our lives, we're being brought by others. Even by a circumcision ceremony, there's the custom of the kvater. That's the one that brings the baby in. Of course, we walk down to the aisle with our parents. At every stage of life, we have someone accompanying us. The Nazir, who completed his period of being a Nazir with holiness, he has to bring himself. He has ascended to this high stature. There's no one that is his equal, and the only person that can bring him is indeed himself. He goes to the temple, he goes to the tabernacle, he brings various sacrifices, his hair is shorn off, it's put in the fire as well, and when he is done, he is still called a Nazir. The Kohen shall wave them as a wave service before Hashem, this is verse 20, it shall be holy for the Kohen, aside from the breast of the waving and the thigh of the raising up. Afterward, the Nazarite, the Nazir, may drink wine. After successfully completing the Nazir's spiritual immersion of 30 days or however it was, that status, even though he's done, he's still on a Nazir, hopefully he will take what he had earned with him onward. And then we read about the priestly blessings. These are the daily blessings that the Kohanim, the priests, are instructed to, to convey to the Jewish people. Hashem spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and to his sons, saying, So shall you bless the children of Israel, saying to them, May Hashem bless you and safeguard you. Hashem May Hashem illuminate his countenance for you and be gracious to you. May Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. Let them place my name upon the children of Israel, and I shall bless them. Rashi tells us that in the temple, the tabernacle, they would use the ineffable name of God. Of course, today, when we do the blessings in the diaspora, it's only done on festivals. But in Israel, it's done every day. But we don't use the ineffable name of God. We use the other name that we are allowed to pronounce. There's a very scary Rashi here in verse 26. It seems like these are going in ascending order. God's going to bless you and safeguard you. And then the next step, he will illuminate his countenance to us, be gracious to us. And the final, the final step, the pinnacle, the epitome of our hope, may Hashem lift his countenance to you and establish peace for you. What does Rashi say? A little bit scary. God will conquer his anger. Even though the blessings are moving up from a lower level to a higher level, the highest level and this is a little bit scary, is that God does not get angry at us. You know, we tend to think of ourselves, we're pretty good. Uh, a lot of Jews study much less Torah than us. They are they do much fewer mitzvahs than us. They give less charity than me. We're good. We're one of the good guys. And here we see the highest level is that God will not get angry on us. That's a little bit of a scary idea. Chapter 7 is the longest chapter in the entire Torah. And it tells us of what happened once the tabernacle was erected, the week and a half afterwards, the various heads of the tribes brought offerings, brought gifts. This was the first time that Aaron blessed the people. The first day of Nisan, that very important day, once the tabernacle was erected for good, Moses transfers his status to Aaron. Moses is no longer the Kohen. He's been demoted. He's regular Levite. Aaron and his sons now, everything's anointed. Everything's ready to go. And... The gifts of inauguration, the celebration of the inauguration, will commence. It was on the day that Moses finished erecting the tabernacle that he anointed it, he sanctified it, and it's all and all its utensils, the altar and all its utensils, and he had anointed and sanctified them. The leaders of Israel, so first the, the tribes, they brought various wagons and oxen which were needed for the transportation of the tabernacle. The tabernacle was erected in Sinai, and then eventually it's going to be moved. And when it's moved, of course, it's moved by the Levites, but they have to have oxen and wagons to help transport them. And then the bulk of the chapter is going to detail one by one the 12 tribes of Israel on their heads of the various offerings they brought on successive 
days. So first of all, verse 1 actually tells us a very interesting idea. It was when Moses finished erecting the tabernacle. And Rashi asked the question, wait a minute, Moses wasn't the only one who worked on the tabernacle project. Of course, you had Betzalel and Ahaliyav and all the wise people of the Jewish people, they joined in working on the tabernacle. So why does the verse attribute the completion of the tabernacle solely to Moses? And he tells us a very powerful idea. Because Moses, he committed his all to the tabernacle, he had self-sacrifice, he gave up everything for the tabernacle, it's considered as if it was solely his. When do you earn something from a spiritual perspective? It's when you forfeit something for, you give up of yourself, of your identity, of your life. You're committed to it completely, then indeed you earn it. And then we read about the leaders of Israel, the heads of the the tribes. They brought offerings and they brought sacrifices and they brought tributes for the tabernacle, initially the wa- the wagons and the oxen, and subsequently the various gifts for the tabernacle. Who were these leaders? Who were these heads of the tribes? Rashi tells us these were the police officers. These were the guards in Egypt. They were the ones in charge of making sure the Jewish people did their job, and they would be hit by the Egyptians, meaning the Egyptians would appoint one Jew to oversee a bunch of Jews, and the Jew's job, the 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 appointee, the commissioner, was to make sure that the quotas are reached by the many slaves. And when the Jewish people did not deliver the goods, who suffered? It was the people who were in charge, and they were the ones who were hit by them. And my grandfather would always point out that the qualification, what are the credentials that you need to be a Jewish leader? You have to suffer on behalf of the constituents of the people that you are leading. Today, we think of someone going to a school, to going to university, going to get a doctorate, someone to write a thesis, to be able to be a politician, to be able to be a leader. In the Jewish nation, for our people, What are the credentials? What are the necessary qualifications? You have to absorb blows on behalf of the Jewish people. That renders you someone who's worthy of leading them. And they're volunteering to give all kinds of good stuff towards the project, towards the tabernacle. Rashi tells us, and we spoke about this previously, that when Moses called out for donations for the tabernacle, for the materials for the tabernacle, the heads of the tribe, these very same people, they said, you know, we'll wait till the end. We'll give whatever whatever they don't cover. And in fact, they underestimated the generosity of the Jewish people. And the Jewish people covered everything. And there was nothing left for them. And they had to only give the Avni Shom, the Avni Milum, the various stones of the breastplate and the ephod, the apron-like garment of the high priest. And now, when, this is uh, six months later, when the tabernacle is done, there's another opportunity to give, and they say, we're not waiting to see what no one else covers. We're going to jump ahead. Previously, the Torah had deducted a letter from their name as a way of criticizing them, and now they said, okay, we're not going to wait for someone to say, okay, this is what's left over for you. We're going to jump ahead and we're going to volunteer on our own what we're going to give. And then we read in verse 11, Hashem said to Moses, one leader each day, one leader each day shall they bring their offering for the dedication of the altar. And then it lists 12 different paragraphs that describe the identical dedication offering of each one of the heads of the tribes of Israel. The one who brought his offering on the first day was Nachshon, the son of Aminadav, of the tribe of Judah. His offering was one silver bowl, which weighed 130 shekels, one silver basin, which weighed 70 shekels, both of them filled with fine flour mixed with oil for a meal offering, one gold ladle that weighed 10 shekels filled with incense, one young bull, one ram, one sheep, for an elevation offering, one he goat for a sin offering, and a feast 
peace offering, two cattle, five rams, five he goats, five sheep in their first year. That was the offering of Nachshon, the son of Amina, the very specific gift. And then you read the next paragraph, and we read about the leader of the tribe of Yisachar, and he brings the identical gift, again, the same silver bowl, the silver basin, the gold ladle, and the exact same animals for the same sacrifices. And then it goes on tribe after tribe for 12 paragraphs for the 12 tribes of Israel. So there's a few questions. The obvious question is, why is it repeated so many times? It could have shortened it. We know how careful the Torah is to not expend extra words needlessly, and yet over here it seems to disregard that principle, and it lists again and again the exact same gift. That's question number one. Question number two, if you actually look and compare these paragraphs, you'll notice that there is a slight difference between the first one and the subsequent 11. It does not say that he was the Nasi, that Nachshon ben Aminadav, that the leader of the tribe of Judah was the Nasi, the, the prince, the leader. It just says of the tribe of Judah. Whereas the subsequent 11, it says the Nasi, the prince or the leader of their tribe, number one. Number two, it says in verse 13, and his offering was one silver bowl, etc. It's almost as if there was an offering beforehand, but there really isn't someone offering beforehand. They were the first one. So there's two discrepancies between the first one and the subsequent 11. So the commentaries tell us that the reason why it does not give him the same honor, so to speak, as the rest of them is because he went first. And of course, the tribe of Judah is also the tribe of royalty, of the monarchy. And therefore, there is a suspicion that someone of that tribe is likely to have a certain degree of hubris, a degree of of aloofness, I'm better, and therefore to, to kind of create equality between the tribes and to remove potential likelihood of competition, he was not labeled as the Nasi, as the, as the prince, as the leader, and the indication was given as if there was someone who preceded him. Now, the Ramban, he explains that these inauguration gifts, it covered each different type of offering. There was, of course, the meal offering, the ketores, the incense offering, an elevation offering, a sin offering, and a peace offering. These are all the variety of offerings in the tabernacle. Therefore, as we kick start the tenure of the Jewish people with the tabernacle, each offering type is brought at the beginning. And he suggests that it might be a mitzvah to celebrate and inaugurate the temple and the altar whenever you're erecting a tabernacle, a temple, or an altar, there's a mitzvah to make a big celebration and inauguration ceremony. And he goes through historically. Solomon did it. He brings proof to that. The Second Temple, the Men of the Great Assembly, did that. And indeed, we have this to look forward to. In Messianic times, there's going to be a very grand celebration with the building of the Third Temple. May it come speedily in our days. Now, this precise offering, this precise set of gifts that all the heads of the tribes brought there's a lot of mystical meaning behind it. So Rashi tells us, for example, the silver bowl, the gematria is 430, corresponding to the age of Adam when he died. It weighs 130, because that's how old Adam was when he was born. The silver basin corresponds to Noah's. It weighs 70, corresponding to the 70 nations. There's all kinds of symbolism here, going back all the way to the times of Adam and, and Noah. And we see from this an idea that the tabernacle is the epicenter of the world's holiness. It is a place of worship for all the nations, and even Adam and Noah, who are not the forebears of the Jewish people, the forebears of mankind, they too are represented in this offering to kickstart the time of, of humanity, really having a temple, a tabernacle in its midst. The gold ladle, which is like a hand that corresponds to the Torah, which is given from God's hand. It weighs 10, corresponding to the Ten Commandments. And the word ketores, it's similar to the gematria of 613, corresponding to the mitzvahs. And then we have the bull, the ram, and the lamb, which corresponds to Abram, Isaac, and Jacob. And then we invoke Joseph and Moses and Aaron and the children of Israel. And it corresponds to the Kohanim, the Levites and the Israelites, and the Torah, the Nevi'im, the Tzuvim, the Torah, the prophets, and the writings, and the five books of the Torah, and the five 
of the Ten Commandments on one tablet and the five of the Ten Commandments of the second tablet, which is a long way of saying that these gifts were not random. But what's interesting is that Rashi offers his commentary not on the first tribe, not by the tribe of Judah, but by the second tribe, the tribe of Issachar. And the obvious question is, why does Rashi explain it only the second time that it is mentioned? And of course, more broadly, we have to understand why this is repeated so many times. The Torah is generally so skimpy in its words, yet here it seems to throw that rule out the window and repeat it again and again and again for uh, 70 plus verses. And the Ramban, he offers several answers. He says that the Almighty is giving honor to those that fear him. If it just said it once and then it said, okay, this was done to him, to him, to him, to him, to him, to him, you know, all 12 people, each one of them is not getting their moment to shine, their moment in the spotlight. And therefore, to show this idea that the Almighty, when 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 people are saying, we're committed to you, the Almighty says, okay, I'm going to commit myself to you in return, and you're going to get your moment to shine, and we're not just going to make you a footnote, an afterthought, you're going to have your own verse. Obviously, this is uh, incomparable, but it's somewhat analogous. There was a Air Force graduation a couple of days ago, and the president, he spoke, and after his speech, there was nearly a thousand graduates of the Air Force Academy. Each one of them walked up to the president, each one of them saluted, and he saluted them back. They shook hands with each and every one of them. Each one of them had their five seconds with the president. He wished them good luck, and they had their time. They had their moment. They had their graduation with the president. And here, the same thing. The Almighty is saying, each one of you is special. It's not just another gift. You're not just copying the previous guy. This is special. This is unique. And you're going to have your paragraph in the Torah to tell us and tell the world and tell history about your gift. Alternatively, the Ramban gives another fascinating answer. He says, that while each one of them brought the identical offering, each one of them brought it for different reasons, each as a reflection of their own tribe and their own tribe's destiny. A different intent renders it a different action. So you may ask, the question was, well, they're identical gifts, so why is it repeated? The answer is, well, they weren't identical gifts. Each one independently came up with their own reason as to why they brought that particular gift. And maybe that's why Rashi writes this on the second tribe. You know, you may think the second tribe, they're just copying the gifts of the previous day. No, there was meaning behind the second tribe's gifts. And it wasn't just a, a means of copying what the guy had done the previous day. And some have also argued that maybe the reason why it's repeated is because you may have thought that everyone just randomly brought what they had. They brought their leftovers. You happen to all have these basins and these ladles and these things in their homes. no. Each consciously chose to bring these specific offerings. Alternatively, we could point out the vast discrepancy between how God praises and how God criticizes. These very same people, six months prior, they were a little bit late. They were a little bit tardy in giving a gift for the fundraising of the tabernacle. And God criticized by reducing their name by one letter. One letter was deducted from their names. And here, they're being praised? And maybe you think that they get an additional letter? No. They get an additional 70 verses. Why? Because there is a vast gulf between how God criticizes versus how he praises. And the Parsha concludes by listing the total gifts of all the 12 leaders of the tribe. And finally, when Moses arrived at the tent of meeting to speak with God. He heard the voice speaking to him from atop the cover that was upon the Ark of the Testimony from between the cherubs, and he spoke to him. Moses was right outside the Holy of Holies, and the voice of God boomed to him and to him only from inside the Holy of Holies, from atop the Ark between the cherubs. Thank you for listening. The email address is rabbiwolby at gmail.com. I look forward to hearing from you and to sharing some insights into Netflix Parsha next week.